who is here for the first time? Put hands up. A good. Why is that good? It's fewer than before. Anyway, come come back more because we've got a fantastic program. In fact, we're going to add a few more names to the autumn and winter. We're closed for the August, but um, this is best value for five pounds. You don't get to meet somebody like Rocco Forte uh, that easily. <laughs> Now, um, you might see me one of my hotels. <laughs> <laughs> I've been to many of your hotels. I, I never see you there. Do you actually go to your hotels? <laughs> when, all the time. How, when was the last time you went to your own hotel? Uh, well, at lunchtime, it was at Browns. Oh, at Browns. <laughs> Is that because it's cheaper? Do you get a discount? <laughs> do you actually get a Do you pay fully or do you get a discount? Well, it depends. If I'm there for business, I, I pay. I don't pay. If I'm there uh, on my own account, yes, then I get a discount. And the monkey business? Monkey business. <laughs> How much, <laughs> what discount do you get? I wouldn't go to your, hotel, your own hotel for monkey business. <laughs> How much discount do you give yourself as an owner or chair? How does what? How much discount do you give? Well, um, it, it depends. If if there's rooms available, then I don't, I don't, don't pay. I don't pay for the room. And I pay 50% on food. Why would you want to stay? Why would you want to stay? Yeah, I'm talking talk about the restaurant for a, for a bit. Now you're just talking about the room now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, All right. Yeah, well, look, listen. I want to go to Ventura, I go to Ventura, which is my resort in the south of Sicily. There, which you're going to yes. come to yes. with this million dollars. Yes. Then, uh, then I go there on holiday sometimes, and then I have to pay if the hotel is. Is it that I have to pay for my room? Uh, it's not clear in the invitation whether we have to pay. <laughs> <laughs> it's Vivian W. paying for the whole Vivian W. was paying for the whole thing. Oh, good. Excellent. Coming. <laughs> uh, listen, when you, I mean, you're a hotelier. The whole point of you being here is for us to ask you a hotelier. I just wondered, when you go off to other people's hotel, where you can't stay in your own hotel, let's just concentrate on where you go to other people's hotel. When was the last time when you were rather impressed and perhaps even irritated by the fact that another hotel had better service or better ideas than yours and that indeed whether you copied any of these ideas? Not for a long time. <laughs> well, when was the last time? I don't know. It's very difficult to say. But I mean, I like hotels, you know, I go to hotels even because I like the feel of them, I feel that uh, I'm looked after properly uh, and so on, and they recognize me and I feel, I feel welcome. They're not necessarily hotel, for example, I go to uh, the Principe Savoy in Milan. Yeah. Uh, the general manager there I used to work for Trust Us Ford, so he, he knows me well, and I'm very, very look, well looked after. The staff in my, the hotel is ghastly. <laughs> <laughs> Because when you ask people, not everybody nowadays will say because I'm well looked after, even though the hotel is not as good or even worse than one ought to be. Uh, but I, I can understand why you want to go there. Uh, but I mean, have you not told us, General Manager, that he's got to pull us off something, tell his own, the, 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 the Principia? So, yeah, well, so you, can't, you can't tell the Sultan of Brunei very much. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, I mean, when you, when you go to your own hotel, are you always very critical? I mean, do people dread the idea that you're staying with them and that they, 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 they fuss a bit and, and they're sort of living in a sort of soft rain of terror? They try and cheat, but it doesn't always work. Yeah. So they think, because, but I, I remember in, in the old trust house forty days, they used to go and visit hotels. And of course, they knew in advance. At one point, I had a big thing about this. we had living in quarters for staff in the hotels, getting those up to scratch. Uh, and so the first thing I do when I got to the hotel was go and visit the staff quarters. And I go around and I put my hand on the wall and I come away with wet paint. They were sort of paint <laughs> <laughs> in front of me. Um, that doesn't happen with my hotels today. But I mean, I'm super critical and I see everything that, that's, that's wrong. It doesn't matter. Um, if they know uh, I'm coming, because if the hotel isn't properly run, uh, 
that they can't get it right. What is the one thing that always goes wrong that you find consistently that you don't, that you have to bang on about? Well, there are sorts of things, but I mean, the, the, you know, the service in restaurants, for example, you get three people in a row asking if you want more water if you want another yes, that is the most irritating thing in the world. It happens to me today. I mean, I was sitting on my own having lunch, and this man came up to me and asked me whether I want, you know, he says, physio or, or still, and I had physio, and then he came along whilst I was looking at my crossword and gave me still water. He was stupid as well, but it is <laughs> incredibly irritating. The most difficult thing about the hotel business and the restaurant business, which you know something about, is that effectively your lowest paid employees are the ones who are in front of the customer and dealing with the customer and actually getting them uh, trained and organized and motivated to do the job properly is very, is very difficult indeed. Yeah, Re restaurant, I understand that the hotels I go to because I have no experience, but for example, when you have a hotel where there might have been a tragedy, a murder or something, how do you get rid of that room if you're asked for <laughs> exactly what happened? Have you ever had a room in a hotel where there had been a murder? It doesn't have to be a murder. Or a suicide. People die in hotels all the time. Do they? Yes. How, how often? Well, quite often. <laughs> do, they, do they pay? I mean, what do you say? <laughs> Circumstance. You must say, oh God, it stayed here for 13 days. <laughs> there, there was uh, someone who uh, you know who died in the Dorchester Hotel uh, on the job with a hooker. Uh, <laughs> I don't know anybody. <laughs> <laughs> I know the hooker, but I don't know anybody. <laughs> Philip Ferrari heard about this, you yeah. see, and he'd heard that he died on the tennis court. Oh, yeah. So he rings up the widow and says, I'm terribly sorry to hear about poor so and so. He said, well, at least he died doing what he liked doing best. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's very good. But I mean, what, when, you, when you do have something like that, uh, how do you do it? Uh, what do you do? I mean, uh, just practical things that fascinates me. I mean, blood stain on the carpet or in the lap, <laughs> in the bathroom. Well, what do you do? Well, I mean, if it's a murder, the police come in and it was all red tape and stuff. I know, but afterwards, you, 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 you bring in exorcists. You are a you're an exorcist. exorcist. Yes. Yeah, I don't know if you need to bring an exorcist for that. <laughs> no, it's not necessarily Exorcist. But exorcists you bring in when there's someone who's taken over by a demon spirit, usually. Well, I mean, I, I suppose you don't do that. But I mean, I don't, it's never actually happened to me when I was, the times when I used to work in, in a hotel with someone died. But I mean, obviously, you wait till the night. Then take a coffee out. You wait till the night. Yes. I see. Out the back door. Night so walk. That's easy. <laughs> I see. Yes. <laughs> yeah. That, that's a, that's a, you, you can, uh, actually nowadays don't you have chamber maids in these huge white sort of things? You just dump the dump the body. <laughs> <laughs> um, but um, going back to your early days, you are obviously brought up in an illustrious hotel family. Your father was a legend. Time and um, you um, was you were managing the hotel and so forth, and, and suddenly it's got taken over. And uh, a, a while passed, and you managed to get your name back, and you started the hotel business again. When you started the business on your own, you started RF Hotels or Rocco Forte Collection, or whatever it is. What was what were the one or two things that you said you would not do? Uh, having learned the craft from your father's industry? Well, I don't think I said I, I said I, what I wanted to do. I mean, I didn't want to have, because trust us, what it was a sort of multifaceted business in catering, all kinds of catering, from budget hotels to luxury hotels. I wanted to focus on just luxury hotels. Yes. Uh, so Why did your father have these illustrious high tiles I like to And I remember I used to live in Hampstead Heath, and there's a Trust our Forte Hotel on top of the Hampstead Green, which was a rather person. Yeah, it was a post yes. yes. Why why did he have two strands of hotel? Well, because because I mean it's a bit the way the business uh, started off. But in, in the original Forte group, we started off as a catering business. Then, but then he bought the Criterion, then he bought the Cafe Royal. 
then he bought the Waldorf Hotel, which was the first hotel uh, in Bournemouth. Then he started building in Celsius, which is one, was one of London Airport, which is still there. Uh, and gradually, and then he merged with Trust Houses in 1970. And so Trust Houses had a sort of, had really had the first house, started the first house chain. They started to share for it, done much with, with it. And they had all these Trust House inns around the, around the country. And so it became, you know, it grew that, it, it, it sort of grew up through acquisitions mostly uh, of different types of, of businesses and hotels. But I mean, are you not nostalgic about certain hotels? I mentioned the Waldorf, you mentioned um, uh, the other hotels that your father bought uh, for Criteria, the Cafe Royal. I mean, do you not ever feel nostalgic enough to want to buy them back? Well, I mean, I think it's a question of a bit what you can afford to do. And to, <laughs> to buy them. George Sand back today would be quite sort of prohibitive. Yeah, yeah. But I mean, I did, I did get Browns. Browns was a hotel. Yeah, yeah, Brown, yeah. Also, but and Waldorf. so was the Balmoral Minimum. Yes, but I mean, Waldorf is, is not such an expensive hotel. <laughs> <laughs> they have tea dances there. It's absolutely amazing. I went there the other day and I saw gay couples <coughs> waltzing merrily around. Uh, watched by an average of, uh, audience of about 80 years old, uh, I'm trained, so I was very sweet. We started tea dance for the years ago. Yes, yeah. 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 Palm court. Yeah. Palm court, yeah. But but why didn't you have that in Browns? But, um, <laughs> why didn't you have that in Browns? Because it's not the room to do it. <laughs> <laughs> we had very good afternoon tea at Browns, which was yeah. very popular, very successful. Your sister uh, decorated for uh, all of your hotels. Uh, did she have to twist your arm, or did you have to beg her to go and do the job? <laughs> no, I think when, when I decided to set up again, she wasn't, didn't really believe it, but she thought as a, as a good sister, she should help me, try and help me. And she had a very good idea, she worked at Trust House 40 on that side of things. She had a very good idea, a sense of what uh, decoration of hotels was, what was happening uh, in, in the industry generally, general um, the timing of design of hotels and so on. She had a very sort of good sense of what needed to be done. At the time when we started up, I didn't really, hadn't really thought about that at all. I thought about buying hotels, sorting them out, and then going on and buying the next one. So we, so as a result of Olga, we got this sort of a sense of design running through our hotels, which actually became quite an important factor because it's certainly a way of promoting all the design magazines are interested, the, the, the fashion magazines uh, are interested because there's a design theme to the hotel. Um, and it was the, um, the time, of course, a lot of these designer hotels were very good on the photographs, but they weren't uh, very practical for the guests. Comfortable. Or comfortable, yeah. 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 So it seems to be all the. Uh, yeah, I, I, understand, I understand that side of things. And, um, my involvement is always to see if it works from an operational point of view and also from the guest's point of view. But Before you opened Browns, did you stay in any of the rooms? Uh, in, in Browns itself? Yes. Um, no, I didn't. I stayed in Why? Browns previously. Before I was there, you Before you referred me, after we referred to the Yes, of course I did. Yes. Yeah, before you, you actually opened yes. it. Yes. Yeah. Did you? But I mean, we, we, you know, we, for every hotel we do, we have a prototype room. So there's a yeah. sort of standard room in every hotel. Yeah. And a prototype room, which you I'm not talking about a prototype where you look at the thing. I'm talking about where you go in and you actually sleep there and have a shower. And, and make sure that, it works. But yeah. I can't sleep in all the rooms. In I know. <laughs> you you <laughs> said in one or two. Yes, I do. Yes. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. And, and, and I go back to the hotels regularly and sleep in different rooms. Because some people have grand suites which they keep solely for themselves. I don't do that. In fact, I'm very annoyed when I put in the presidential suite because it means they haven't sold it. Well, yes. I mean, is there, is there a presidential suite at Browns? Hmm? Is there a presidential suite at Browns? Yes, there is. Yeah. How much is it a night? £8,000 a night. Yeah. Yeah. What's, the it's, it's, what's the rate? It's what's very it? cheap at the price. Uh, well, it is quite... By, by London standards, I suppose. Yes, yes. that's not very expensive. Yes. Yes. Do you, do you, do you complain about that? Yes. <laughs> do you have to 
Do you have your discount to get it filled? Discount? Yeah. If I stay. Yeah. yeah. No, not you, but somebody else. But it depends who it is. And it, could, and it depends where. Right. I mean, I have most, I, you know, there's, there's the economic forum in, um, in Petersburg. Oh, what? At the, 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 the Astoria Hotel. Yeah. It's an economic forum there. And it's a sort of packed out. Yeah. And the, the, um, uh, the Astoria, of course, is full of very, very high rates. And Renzi, the Italian prime minister, is there. And uh, a couple of the people who, Montezemolo and Malagog, were running the Olympic bid yeah. uh, for 2024, uh, want to be there with Renzi. So yeah. I said, I found them three rooms, but they don't want to pay for the four nights. Because <laughs> we sell, we sell the, the bases you take the four nights or not at all. So I thought, like, at the end of the day, I suppose I'm going to have to put my hand in my pocket. Uh, but do you have policies where you have at certain times of the year you know, demand four nights and which which I suppose you might do in your resort hotel sometimes? Yes, you do. You would have because there's so, too much so demand. During the, sort of the height of the season, yeah, there's the demand and also, you know, if you if people take it for, for, for you know, you can't fill in the in between periods. Well, let me ask you two right questions right. which which I always find. If you have a very loyal customer who is actually spending money all the time during the year when you are in the low season, and it comes to the high season, would you tend to apply the same kind of premium to him or her? No. Right. So there, is a spe there take, are special we take, Yes, we would take that into account, of course. And don't you think it's an incredibly stupid thing to do for hotels to charge people if they had a late checkout when the hotel is actually not full. Yes. Really? Well, no, that, that's exactly <laughs> Because, I mean, you always get people telling you about the policy. I don't promise you that we don't, some of my owners don't try and get away with it. Uh, but usually if someone, you know, I, people do write to me. Yes. Um, um, although less than they did when I, when I first uh, started, started out. Uh, some people was right because they, they want, to get, they want to get a freebie. You know, they, they, they invent, they invent <coughs> something late. And, and you usually can see it in the way the rep. Well, what do you deal with, with complaints? What do you, how do you deal with complaints? So, so when, I, when I first started, um, and I still do, I dealt with every complaint. Every complaint comes in, I immediately ring up the general manager, what's happened? I made a big fuss. Uh, and, uh, and so the general manager understood it was important because they're all new, mostly new people to, uh, to the company who are working with me. Um, and, and then I'd, I'd also write to the guest, sometimes just to say that, uh, uh, just to acknowledge that and say it's been told. Why not all the time? All, 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 well, all the time I do answer. I do some answer. Guests, answer. Some guests I bring up. Yeah. And they were so embarrassed. Often, usually they're completely embarrassed that they should have they should, oh, I don't want to do that. I didn't want to create any bother for anybody or trouble for anybody and so on, which meant that the, 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 the complaint wasn't really a very serious one, as you understood it. But, but, but it's important complaints. Wonderful. If a customer complains to you, it's great because it means if he, if he doesn't complain, he's unhappy. It means he'll never come back to the hotel again. <laughs> if he complains to you, you can get hold of that customer and make him a friend for life. So why didn't you immediately write back and say, I'm very sorry, but I'll have to investigate and somebody will come contact you. Isn't that, wouldn't that be a good policy? Well, every, every letter I get, I immediately write back that minute. It takes me 15 seconds to say, I'm very sorry, I apologize, and I'm going to have this looked at. Yeah, but I'd like, to, I'd like to find out something about the complaint before I reply to that. The the customer is always right. right. Uh, <laughs> customer yeah. always right. Theoretically, yes. Well, practically as well, I suppose, if they would want to be. But um, okay. when, I was, when I was a young, very young man, actually at school, I was doing a weekend job at the Friar Tuck, which was serving behind the yeah, that's right, right. That's, We had a policy that if anybody complained of co coffee, you check and gave them a fresh, fresh cup. And I just brewed this coffee in his yeah. own fashion with yeah. machines. And I gave the customer a, a, a cup and he complained. And so I gave him another one, still complained. I said, Look, I've just brewed this coffee. Um, and he said, well, uh, he said, he said, I know Mr. Forty, my father, yes. 
He said, well, I, th I, said, I said to him, I think I very much went from you. You said, but wrong. <laughs> you're, you're, you're a slightly yeah, so The customer isn't always right. You have to pretend that No, I'm sorry, Rob. No, 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 I mean, you've got Sicily, Rome, and, and so forth. I mean, do you feel that you have to be there all the time, or, or how often do you go to Sicily or Rome to look at your two star hotels? Well, you can't be there. You can't be there all the time. And you've got to, you know, you've got to run a business of any size through the through people, through other people. That's what Philip Green said this morning. Yes. I wasn't there. I've got, you know. Thousand people. <laughs> that doesn't mean you're not responsible. Well, they are accountable. Okay. If you were there, then you, were, you might not have been responsible for this, but you are accountable. Then. But uh, ultimately, you are. But how are your wife? Is she critical when she goes off and stays in the towers or eats in a restaurant and suddenly you know, she finds something wrong? Does she ring you up or. or no, she or when she, 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 she tells me to sort of calm down. I get <laughs> <laughs> I can't believe that. I know your wife. She's much more exciting than you. Things I don't know. I get very irritated, obviously. The service is, is bad at one of my hotels. I, I must say, I, 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 I don't think I've ever complained to you, but when I asked you to, to, to look at something or something, you always come back and, and, and very kindly. And I was very embarrassed when, on one occasion, I, think I couldn't get into one of your hotels, and I think the one in Brucey, and, uh, and you immediately made it possible for me to. to to, to, to get a room for the day and not pay for it. So I, I was very embarrassed. I, I can't remember all I did to repay you, but... but uh, <laughs> and you were very generous. I want to ask you... No, but it's... it's um, uh, you know, you can't... Um, you, 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 I mean, what you've got to try and create is a culture in the business where people want to deliver what you, what you want and through them training and the way you follow up and deal with things, you've got to be very consistent. Then you get you, you get the same levels of service throughout your hotels. And it's very it's very uh, it's each country is slightly it's slightly different. In Germany, Germany is the easiest place to to to, to run hotels because you say, you know, I want that there. And they put it there every day, day after after day. In Italy you say I want that there and they say Ah, yes. <laughs> but today, I think it's going to be like that. Tomorrow, we put it like that. Uh, I mean, I'm going to have a German shepherd. <laughs> the, 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 in, uh, when I took over the Astoria in St. Petersburg, the staff didn't smile. The customer was a bloody nuisance. <laughs> Someone interfered with the normal, normal course of their day. And it took quite a quite an effort, actually, to change the, uh, the attitude to make them smile. Every time I went to the hotel, I'd smile. <laughs> so I was to make them understand. The, the, GM, the GM, general manager, was a very intelligent guy, actually, when, uh, when I took over the hotel, was ex-KGB. <laughs> <laughs> As most people in Russia were. And, uh, and uh, so I sent him off to Harvard Business School to do one of the short courses. He came back, I made him managing director. So he dealt with all the Russian stuff, yeah. and I put in the general manager and knew how to run a hotel, and the thing worked. You know, and every time I had a few local difficulties, he solved them. <laughs> <laughs> so it was a, a perfect, a perfect okay. and very successful hotel. Now the, the, the critical question for me is, what's going to happen at the hotel? We hear that something like uh, uh, Airbnb or whatever it's called, uh, Airbnb. Yeah, it, it is, it, it's cultivating a kind of culture, or people tell me that the way in which guests now want to go and stay in a hotel is fast fading because they want experience, then they go and look for houses and, and so forth. Do you find that has any impact, or do you think that you might have to adjust your future plans in order to accommodate this? ostensible change in attitude by, by customers that choosing hotels. 
I don't, I, I don't, I think it affects low levels of the market more than it affects the top end, top end of the market. And I think, you know, there'll be problems coming out of it uh, in, because of consistency, because of, uh, you know, issues that have arised. You know, who tells you, know, you know, who owns it, you know, it's, it's responsible to make behind it. Uh, and uh, if there are issues, that they, they, can, they can be dealt with. Um, so I don't, I don't think it's so much a direct competitor to the real luxury, luxury hotel. So you think that the, the, the luxury end will always be uh, protected, as it were? Well, I mean, protected. I mean, so it's, it's exposed, it's exposed to, to some degree, to the online travel agents, who, who uh, of course, try to port the market and force all the business through them. Uh, and charge very high commission rates. A normal travel agent charges 10% commission. Uh, they charge up to 25%. Um, and uh, and in, in, my, in my country, it's about 8% of our business comes through them. But we found a way now of controlling and managing the flow when it comes to them. We get it when we want to, we, don't, we turn it off when we don't want to. But it's, uh, it, it, that's, that's a real threat. Okay, you're in the top end of the uh, uh, um, uh, industry, you've got luxury hotels, and this is my last question before I'm going to go into the form. Uh, have you ever discussed with um, your sister um, why it is that in all the bathrooms you have, first of all, you have overhead lighting, which makes us look three times as bad as we actually are. <laughs> and number two, why on earth do you have marble? Floor, which is the most slippery <laughs> surface. Well, I think uh, I don't. We don't always have marble on the floor, um, but but um, uh, Rad, the, I mean, the most luxury bathrooms are yeah, about marble, and because because people consider those, them to be luxurious, they are most stupid, and they look, and they look very very good. Uh, Even a tile. I, I must say, I don't. Uh, tiles are just a slippery. Not so much you're going to mat tiles now. Uh, they're, they're scratched. They're, they've got sort of grooves. They don't look very nice and they're very difficult to clean. Well, anyway, I mean, I, I know because I've, I've heard um, the Duke of Edinburgh remark once that it is the most stupid surface to put on a bathroom, and I tend to agree. And how about the lights? I mean, you know, every room looks the know. worst when there's an overhead light. I think some lighting is very bad, some lighting is very good. I think the, 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 the worst thing is when you have uh, you have a mirror in front of the wash face and you have a light behind you, which throws your shadow onto the mirror, so you can't see yourself in the mirror to shave. And if you're a woman, more important to make out. Uh, I must say, I've never had a mirror behind my back looking into a mirror, but there it is. Um, but I just find that extraordinary that everybody has, including your hotel, I've never slipped on the floor of the uh, I've never slipped on the floor of the bathroom. Or was it put a mat on that side? There's always a bath mat outside. I know, so why? Because yeah. it's so dry, it's so, so dry, it's 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 so dry. All right, well, I'm not the whole of the floor. Okay. These are things that I've always wanted to, to, to learn from Italians and so forth, but I'm afraid I'm not the wiser today. Perhaps I was too busy. So, who has got an uh, even more difficult question or tricky question for the Sirocco? Yes. Let's just have the so that everybody can hear you. Right. Yeah. In a world where the, the customer is becoming more needy and wanting better service, better attention, when uh, we need to look for personalized service, and there's a lot more competition with new type of hotel, you know, with this sense of community and new concept. What have you done in terms of data collection from your, you know, key customer to make sure you can give them ultimate service so they come back using, you know, new technology and getting to know them through social media or whatever. What have you changed in the way your hotel is? Uh, well, the, 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 apart from obviously the technology side is something you have to keep up with. You know, hotels, whenever people are having their homes, they also want in a hotel, in a hotel bedroom. But, but the, the, the service element is, is always the most, the most important. And that's where you have to, 
had to work uh, very hard and, and put a lot of effort uh, into, into your staff. But, but some, some could tell us it's quite a high staff turnover which you try and control. So you'll, you'll continue training uh, new members, members of staff. We, we have a sort of rigorous induction pro, uh, process. Um, we, uh, we, we say that our hotels, uh, I think they are, uh, all individual and that they relate to the place in which they're, uh, they're in. So a part of the induction is the history of the hotel, uh, the, 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 the town, the, town in which the hotel finds itself, take staff around the town so they know the, uh, the important places that, and they can talk to the customer about, about the, the history of the company, then our service ethos and so on, and then training them actually for the job that they, they've got to do. But the most difficult thing I think for, for staff is interaction uh, with the customer on, the, on a natural basis. And that's, that's you know, you go to hotels, you always ask the same question. And so, I sometimes go into a hotel and I say, I, I get some person, someone will say, do you have a good flight? And I say, thank you very much. The next person says, do you have a good flight? And the next person, <laughs> some start thinking, well, maybe they know something about the flight and I do. <laughs> uh, and so uh, we're working quite hard on developing, um, uh, developing training for start to help them to interact in a more natural way uh, with, uh, with the customer. And we're working actually with the School of Life, uh, uh, which is um, uh, uh, Alain de Botton's uh, set up. Um, he's, he's a philosopher, he's developed the School of Life, which is uh, a writer. Uh, he was here talking about it. Yeah, and uh, which sort of uh, helped people to cope with everyday problems. And I said, we've developed a series of training courses now and then to actually get our staff to understand customers individual and, and to react. Uh, so do you now tell your people not to ask whether you were a good flight? Yes. Uh, quite right. I mean, and, uh, but, but it's, I always think it's so irritating. It's difficult. I mean, you have no, come from. You know, you have no, no problem starting up a conversation with anybody in, in, in the street. I have less, more trouble than you do when I manage, manage it. Most people, it isn't, it isn't such an easy, yeah. easy thing to do, particularly if you're not But the also, the other, other absurd um, practice is when they show you a room and they open the lid and they think it's more courteous for you to go first. Well, you don't know where the bloody <laughs> room is. Um, yeah. Don't you think it's more natural for you to tell your staff, and all your staff always say, after you say, I said, I don't know where I'm going. You <laughs> leave your way. Isn't that more sensible? Yes, I think you're right, actually. I don't think we can tell our staff to, to I think you should do that. Allow me to leave you And also, room. particularly if it's a, a, a female and a uh, member of staff, and you're a man, I, I, I always say, you know, you leave the way. I always say that. Someone else start with sex. Is someone else is saying that. Yes, I mean, that's dangerous. I know, you let a woman go first. But, I mean, in, in answer to your question, I mean, I was a director of the Savoy Group, which managed the carriages, Barclay, and, and so was I, yeah, time. five years, <laughs> different time. And I knew that they operated a system where the highest payer, and in fact, we have that in our restaurant, in all the restaurants in London, when you, when you pay a lot of money, you go, the average pay, you go whoomph, right up on the, on the lead table. I mean, the people don't tell you there's a lead table. So if you ring up the ivory and you say, I'm Mr. X, can I book a table? Immediately, your name will appear. And if it appears in the top lead, you know, you get a table immediately. Whereas, uh, the same with hotels. When, when you go up to that lead table, you get special preferential treatment. The highest pair. Sorry? The highest pair. Yeah, the highest pair, yeah, exactly. So what I do is that when I go to a new restaurant, I order the most expensive wine, and then I try to stay up there all the time. <laughs> and then next time I go, I order plonk. <laughs> but I mean, do you have that system? Not quite. Not quite. Not quite. Obviously. Not really. Yeah, not obviously. But we, what we do now is, is regular customer. We know who our regular customers are across the group. So. If you stayed at the Dome C in Rome and you come to Browns, you know all about you with the Browns. 
shall serve the business and provide <coughs> these lights and so on. So we can provide them without you know, well, when, when, when the regular customer also your drink in It was exactly the opposite uh, when Blackstone owned Clarity's because the, all the old customers took time to pay and all that. They didn't, simply didn't want them. So, so in fact, I know all the old customers were not They were ringing them out just to pay. I know, I know. Quite right. But they made 400 million pounds. So, so, you know, whatever. They must be the worst yeah. sellers in the world. They ruined and they destroyed a wonderful group in the process. Hello. What's the most valuable lesson you've learned in business? Most valuable lesson in my life or in, in the business? In the hotel business? In business, Jeff. Well, it's only been in one business. <laughs> Hello. Hello. <laughs> it's very difficult to say what the most valuable lesson I, I once, uh, my father was once. Um, went to his office, he was meeting with someone. Um, and uh, after the guy left, I said, why are you seeing that guy? There's no use to you. And he said, yes, but I'm very useful to him. <laughs> and I think sometimes, you, you know, uh, it's right to spend time with people, uh, even if it's a waste of your, your time, because one way or another always pays, pays back. You tried to reject this. What? You tried to reject this. Yes, I think that's that's it. that's that's very important. I think some people are so you know uh, focused on on, uh, on their own self interest that, that they can't do that. And I think that's very bad. And particularly in, a, in a, an industry like the hotel industry, is a, it's an industry of particular top at the top end of the market about generosity, about being generous. Can I just ask, I mean, in your industry, I mean, there are some huge chains, right? Yeah. Four Seasons, it sells PDs 35 times, things like that. But we don't have a head. I mean, do you find that odd that there are these chains, the, the Four Seasons, the perhaps the, the, the um, um, what do you call it, the uh, Ritz Carlton or the Ritz? where there is no head to relate to, it's just one big corporation, yet they're incredibly successful. So do you Well, I mean, it's not true. You see, Four Seasons had Isidore Sharp, who founded it and developed it, and, developed it. and, and it had a great ethos, and it was extremely well run. He was directly involved, all his managers and loyalty. It was impossible to prize a Four Seasons manager away from Four Seasons. There was a consistency across, across the company. He then eventually sold out to Bill Gates and our lead for three and a half billion, a business that was making a hundred million at the time. <laughs> and and uh, so because his children he, he, he destroyed the business. Well, as well. Well, now, now they're busy trying to expand and help help for leather to make to justify the price that they they pay. If you take if you take I mean Marriott still has a more huge company has Bill Marriott is still Walk when I'm the long guy, I think he's not as active as he used to be, he's in his 80s now, but he, he, he still would use someone to go behind the desk and check, and check someone in. They now bought Starwood. Uh, so Starwood, which has uh, a number of different, like Meridian, uh, Sheraton, uh, Star, um, Luxury Collection, and so on, uh, together, uh, Barrett and Starwood, 27 brands. It's huge, I don't know how many hotels they have, thousands of hotels. Uh, it's, it's, so it becomes an enormous organization. And I'm so very happy to be relatively small. I want to get bigger, but I don't want to get so big that I lose touch with what is happening. And having a person at the top who cares and is involved and the staff know that he cares and is involved, uh, and a family, in our case, a family, my children, so I don't know where the business is. You, Tom. Yeah. Yeah, the, the Chinese girl, and then that girl, and then the gentleman. No, the Chinese girl first. Um, are there any way, um, which are, in which way are you planning to expand your business in the future? And um, are there any new industry or markets that you want to enter? 
what am I going to do in the future? Is there, yes, is there any new market you want to, not, not the place, new market uh, that you want to enter into? In, in the sense of uh, uh, geographical? No, not a hotel. Well, first of all, you should ask where else. Yes. Sorry. Mm -hmm. Where else do you want to expand? And are there other kinds of business other than a hotel that you want to expand into? Is that your question? Yes. All right. Yeah, well, I want to, uh, first of all, I'd, I'd like to, have, I need to, uh, you know, a lot of major cities I'm not in, uh, in Europe, where I'd like to be, particularly in Paris. Uh, I'd like to be in, uh, in the United States, in New York, uh, certainly New York, uh, and maybe Miami, Beverly Hills. Thirty-seven percent of our business comes out of the United States into our European hotels. It's a very important market for us, and therefore to have a calling card there is very, very useful and would help uh, that flow of business. Um, the, um, the, we already have three hotels in Italy. I have a, share, a recent shareholder who's joined, uh, who's, who's bought twenty percent of the company, which is the Italian Sovereign Wealth Fund. <laughs> Are you sure it's good money? It is a long bonus of his Italiano. It's 80% owned by CDP, which is like Casa de Po in France, Casa de Positi Festi, and 20% of the Bank of Italy. So indirectly, I have the Bank of Italy invested in my company. I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing. Well, <laughs> time will tell. <laughs> they, they have a mission to help Italian tourism, so I'm their luxury. Partner. So we will do quite a lot in, in Italy. We're looking at a lot of development in Italy. Italy is the ultimate tourist destination. It, uh, Italy has 60% of the culture that's available to be seen in, in the world. Uh, and uh, there's a great opportunity there, apart from the weather, the food, and everything else. So, so we will do a lot more there. We're, we're, I've signed an agreement to run a hotel uh, in Shanghai which will open in 2018. And that will be my first step into that part of the world. Whether it leads to other things or not, I don't know at this stage. It's a long way away, and maybe it's for my children to, to develop more uh, in that part of the world. Good luck. <laughs> Good luck. Good luck. Yes. Um, we shouldn't be saying uh, that. This is a China exchange. I know, I know. <laughs> but it's a very tough business. You better start learning Chinese, um, get to know how to bribe people, <laughs> how to maneuver yourself into corruption, and, uh, and, uh, and, and wear a mask whenever you can to get used to being in Shanghai. So far, so far, the relationship has been very good up to now. That is always the case. I mean, <laughs> China has this magic power of mesmerizing everybody at a missio, and then uh, everything goes. Zooming down a bit, um, but I hope I, I wish you well because there are exceptions. There are the extraordinary. Uh, I mean, Shanghai is a good city to, to, to go into, but I mean, very competitive. Uh, but, but, uh, I Why hope you to run a restaurant in the hotel. I will. I would dare to go to Shanghai. Chinese are very. They're very boastful. They they are very angry. They tell you absolute white lies, I mean, not yellow lies, white lies. Mm -hmm. they, they, they pretend for all sorts of things. They, they conjure up figures, they try to impress you. So, anyway, but good luck. Um, <laughs> uh, and, uh, let's at least do questions quickly. Yeah. You and then the gentleman, and then here. Hi, um, I have a question around um, actually the logistics of how kind of your corporate central office is run. I'm curious, I, I've worked in my work group, actually sent um, our sales director. Um, and so I'm curious as how your group has expanded, how your central corporate office has also expanded in function, and then also if you take people sometimes into your corporate office, um, because in the hotel industry, I think a lot of times people come up from hotels, and I'm curious if you ever um, hired into the kind of corporate world of hotels from other industries, and if so, why? Well, I have people from outside of the industry. Just in your corporate office in the, itself, in the, in the corporate you know, office. running the function, I'm curious how that's expanded as your group has expanded, you've opened more hotels, and then you hire people in who haven't necessarily been brought up through your hotels to get a different perspective. Yeah, I think, I think, it's, I think it's quite, uh, obviously, people like 
accountants and so on, you can hire people that, uh, that are not necessarily in the hotel world, although it helps if they've had experience uh, in the hotel world, because then there's, there's, a, there's a shorter learning curve. Uh, for the more so marketing people, you can bring in marketing people who um, have those skills that are not necessarily working uh, in, in the hotel world. Generally, you know, I have I have I have a, a number of executives uh, you know, who, who are good at uh, you know, business side of things, the finance side of things, and not we're not really hoteliers, although they might have worked for a hotel company. Uh, in the parts, but in the the actual operation, the operation, you need people who know what what hotels are about. So I was asking about corporate offers, right? In yeah. particular. So, when you expand. So, I mean, if I have a, a director of operations yeah. running the, the hotel operations, he's got to know the yeah. detail of hotel operations. So, that's when I can't take on someone who's built yeah. motor cars and get him to, he won't be able to do it. And he's dependent on the people below him telling him what to, what to do, and that's no use, because they pull the wool over your eyes all the time. Can, can, can you help? Look at the hat, whoever goes up first. You just give it automatically to the order in which the hats go up again. Because I'm now telling people, wake up, go on. Man with the white hair, then the man with the black hair, and then over here. Should you rather run by the terms? <laughs> well, I always say service is eyes, it's not hands. Thank you, David. Um, two questions. One on, you've just briefly mentioned you're going to, you're going to operate. Um, a hotel in the future. Um, do you see the model of future luxury hotels being split between the asset held by Party A and the operation undertaken by Party B as, as a future model that is likely to uh, gain traction? And the second thing is, and this partly relates to the, the, the previous question, in the UK it strikes me that in this sort of non-London sector, a lot of people are investing in luxury in hotels, for example, like the Eden Group, um, whereby their, their actual wealth experience is in other sectors. And do you see that potential as a trend? Where the experience is? In other sectors, like Peter, Rig Peter Rigby is a, an IT expert, and he's, and he's developed a luxury train chain of, of hotels um, in a regional context. Okay. And he see, it strikes me that there could well be a trend in that direction, and I value your view on that. Well, uh, the, to answer the, the first question, um, I mean, the, the, the industry model has been for a long time one of management of contracts where they would separate the asset ownership from the, uh, from, from, uh, the, the management of the uh, hotels. And it's, and it's true uh, in a lot of in the retail industry to to, to a great degree. With, with hotels, this idea of the management contract uh, has evolved where effectively the hotel operator uh, is paid a fee for running the hotel for the owner. Four Seasons have developed on that, <coughs> on that model. They never, uh, well, they, they did initially own the old hotel, but they, they, they're not, they, with the time they were sold, they didn't own a, a, piece of, a piece of real estate. Ideally, uh, you should own and run your own hotel, but it's 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 impossible to expand uh, at all if you're if you're relying on on your own self to finance uh, your own hotels, particularly in major city centres where hotels are bought on a yield of three or four percent a day. Uh, there's no way you can finance uh, without having huge uh, capital resources to do that. Um, the in, in continental Europe, the model tends to be slightly different because the, the owners of the real estate don't want to enter into management contracts. They want to uh, enter into a lease which gives them a guaranteed fixed, fixed return. And many uh, international hotel companies aren't prepared to take that commitment and take the risk involved in doing that. A number of my hotels are run on that, on that basis. Uh, and if I want to expand in Italy, that's the only, the only model that I can, I can, I can follow. Uh, hotel in Shanghai is a management contract. Uh, is that your uh, first time? Yes. You're going to go into run a hotel that does not belong to you? Yeah, and, you and, and I have one, one open in Jeddah in 
in September, which is also a management project. And I mean, in the, Jeddah. In Jeddah, yes. Which was, which was, which was what's left, actually, of about six hotels that I've sort of signed up in the Middle East before the financial crisis and before the Arab Spring. And they've all effectively disappeared or gone into, uh, into You're not a self drinks. Hmm? You're not a self drinks. No, not in general. So how are you going to make money? Well, you make money through the oh, hotels and, 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 yeah, well, no, not <laughs> discreetly. We have, we have a great, uh, Great selection of soft drinks. <laughs> <laughs> if you make money out of the rooms, what you get more than that. Well, three restaurants in that. But I mean, presumably you are seduced by the idea of people coming to you and just giving you a cut on the on the um, on the management. Yeah, I mean, they pay your fee. Your fee is based partly on the turnover and partly on the profit that yeah, you deliver. Exactly. So I used to think that you do have to. Know, a bit, but, but in fact, I'm changing my mind. If in fact, that the, 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 uh, the, the, uh, the percentage of, of, of fees uh, is, is good enough, um, why take the risk, in fact? Um, so well, I, exactly, exactly, but I mean, for a management economy, you've got to deal with an owner. You've got to deal with an owner who thinks he's an Italian, uh, who always wants to interfere and not let you do what you should be doing to run the True. I was on the board of a company that owned uh, Four Seasons in, uh, in Milan. Uh, we, we were we eventually had a row, and, and in fact, the company went in four minutes away to sell it anyway. But, but they're, they're always at that problem, right? Gentlemen, so, uh, the second question oh, sorry, was second about non hotel is running, uh, running hotels. Well, my, uh, my niece has a, a very good program called the Hotel, hotel Inspector, where she's visiting hotels rather than yes. non hotels. But I mean, I don't know, I don't know the hotels in question, so I don't know how successful. They are. It's not impossible for someone to to get into it and, and uh, understand what it what it means to run hotels and, and run them successfully. It's very subjective, isn't it? To, to own, let's say, Clifton or you know, one of these huge mansions. I was going to say, I think it, I think that there can be changing the vanity projects such as that's why it's, it's an interesting thing to. Mm. All right. Let's hope that they are. Thank um, you. <laughs> all right, the gentleman there. Where do you see innovation in the hotel space? Or who has innovated recently? So who has innovated in the hotel industry? That your hotel industry. That your question. Yeah, or where, or where do you see innovation yeah. in this space? Well, I think there's, a, there's more innovation at the bottom and the end of the market than the top end of the market. You've seen, um, you know, you've seen, uh, you've seen over the last, well, I mean, sort of hotels were in the in, in, in this country. You know, we didn't travel lodge, we started travel lodge because we had a little chef site, so therefore it was cheap to build to build on. Um, and you know that sort of accommodation, uh, which is really convenience accommodation didn't exist before. Now you're getting, you know, uh, you're getting much uh, much smaller, even smaller rooms uh, where people you know, basically have a shower and room and a bed and a desk and you can write. Um, and the, the, uh, the booking, the booking, the booking of it, they're all booked through through the website or the internet. So there's no there's no go between at all, uh, which actually you know, reduces the transaction cost. Uh, that's 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 very that's very innovative. Uh, the uh, in terms of the, that's the point of view of customer experience. Obviously, there's a, a lot of technology has has come in. Uh, which some uh, some good, some bad. I mean, uh, you don't employ the number of people the back of the house that you did uh, in the old days. I can tell because te technology has dealt with it. You don't. You know, you had 20 people in the council department today. You have you have four. Um, you have um, sorry. The the um, uh, front office systems again. You know, everything all that is computerized and. But that can be irritating because you end up going into a hotel where well, once irritating things have happened, but then you have a receptionist busy with a computer and not looking at you and, and greeting you when, uh, when you when you arrive at the desk. Um, but that, uh, and the thing that irritates me most is restaurants, is in restaurants where they're all busy on the computer putting the bloody thing up. I used to have a cashier. I'm trying to, I'm trying to introduce, 
I'm going to try and introduce a cash here into one of my restaurants and see how, see how that, that works. And then in all the analysis and everything, which all the machine does automatically, uh, but at least the waiters will spend their time looking at the, looking at the customer. Well, how about TripAdvisor? I mean, as an innovation, do you welcome it or are you irritated by it? Well, I mean, obviously it can be uh, irritated, but I think, it's, I think generally it's a good thing. Of course, you can, you can manipulate your TripAdvisor yeah. scores, and people do. Do you do that? Yes. <laughs> 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 no, right, well, I'm very happy to hear that. Uh, but I mean, manipulate them in the sense that, you know, you'll be like, no more. <laughs> you yeah. can't. I'm always been very suspicious about the realizer. I know that there are, that there are people fiddling it. Uh, all right, quickly go on. So from slippery bathrooms to slippery topics, I had a question about succession planning in the family business. Yes. Which obviously is key to sort of succession, the succession but also the business development. Uh, I'd imagine it's even more so when it's a customer-facing business where you are in such a public face. But what I'd like to know is what are the practical steps for the next generation that you're taking now to draw them into the business, maybe in certain companies? And what is it for you personally, the sort of thinking that you're adapting and developing to moving away eventually from something that must be like a family as well? Well, I, I went through that experience myself with my father, um, which was, and my father sort of, his, one of his dreams was that I would take over the business from it. Of course, when it came to the moment where I should have taken over, he, he was not very keen to go. <laughs> and I had three very difficult years. Uh, as a result, uh, you know, he sacked me about six times. <laughs> I resigned about four times. And, and, uh, uh, but, but so, so, so it, it, it is difficult. And I think the, I think, uh, so having had that experience, I think I understand a bit of the process. I have my two daughters working in the business. One of them is here uh, this evening, and my son, who I hope will be coming into it. Um, and uh, obviously they've got to learn the business and earn, and earn their spurs and earn the respect of the, of the people uh, in the business. But I think they have to have a responsibility at a, at a very early age. And my father, he never wanted to give me a responsibility because he thought he was afraid I'd make a mistake. You know, I'd make a mistake, I'd bugger, I'd bugger out my, my, my future results. So by the time I didn't have any responsibility until I, until I became chief executive. By then, responsibility was huge, and if you made mistakes, you made very big ones. I think you've got to make mistakes to, to learn. So the mistakes you should make should be little ones. Um, so, uh, with my children so far, so so good, but uh, interesting to hear what they... Have they made a mess of them? Have they made mistakes? Yeah, but not, no, not, you know, not, uh, not, by your reckoning, they should be. Yeah, I, mean, I don't know. They, they, real they, I don't want to embarrass my fault. <laughs> but uh, the, the, uh, the um, no, but, but I think that, um, you know, gradually they have more But have you thought of sending them deliberately to go and learn the craft elsewhere, you know, the Four Seasons or Ritz Carlton, yeah, some other chain? They won't work outside the okay. business. And my son's working outside the business now because I don't want him to come straight straight in without having having work. And he's at he's in the same opinion. Well, hotel, in the hotel industry. Well, he's worked in hotels, but he's now he's not. Uh, yeah, yeah, related to the hotel industry. He's just he's just finished working for CBRE, which is a consultancy industry, and then about hotel valuations. And I said I, I said to him, "What did you learn about hotel valuations?" It's quite simple, Dad. Dad, he said. Whatever the customer wants to value the hotel, that's the value we give <laughs> You've learned a lot. <laughs> yes. uh, okay. What would you say is the, I guess it's very related to innovation, but the next best thing, or what was said really hotel, luxury hotels in part, um, in terms of customer experiences. So for example, scent marketing or you know, addition hotels right now, really coming up with new ways of entertaining their guests to really provide uh, optimal guest experience or internet of things which the big chains are using. What would you say is the next best thing in terms of guest uh, experience in luxury hotels? I don't, I, you know, I don't know that. Everybody's saying, you know, what is, you know, what is the future 
you will ask what the future of hotels is. I don't really know. I think hotels tend to evolve and they follow the trends that are there uh, in the marketplace. What uh, you know, the, the people develop likes and uh, ways of doing things, and that's what they want to find in hotels. So hotels tend to follow rather than, than leave. If you're, if you're over in the too early, you usually, you usually fail. Um, the, but, uh, in, in luxury hotels, I don't think things have changed that much over the last hundred years. You still go into, you know, just the, the initial the service you give has to be has to be at the same level, and that's what makes the difference between one hotel and, and another. Okay, well, I have a last last question. I'm afraid that an hour is actually gone very quickly. Yes. Hi. Um, I know your hotels are very big on resorts. Do you think uh, not expanding into Africa yet is missing out on a big opportunity now that there's a crisis going on in the economy? The crisis going on which economy? The world economy. Yeah, yeah. The world economy. Especially. Well, I'm sorry. I haven't really looked at Africa um, seriously yet. I mean, I think it's interesting the sort of the number of uh, opportunities that, that start to come up. You come to me and say, have you thought about it? I don't really have a have a view. It's a little bit for me like the Far East, where um, you know I don't know. If someone, if someone said to to me, "If one hotel in Rome, where would you put it?" I know exactly where to put it. If it's Hong Kong or Shanghai, so I don't know. I'd have to depend on other people to tell me what the right. Where are you from? Where are you? Are you come from Africa? Nigeria. What? Nigeria. 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 Yeah. Oh, that's a big, that's a big country. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that's probably um, very. Well, I bought very dear from where France. In, uh, they had a lot of uh, in all the ex uh, French French colonies, and I went to I went to visit all of them. Actually. It was the first time they'd seen anybody get off with their arms for five years, uh, uh, which just shows what sort of big organisations uh, are about. And they were all mostly countries which had been run under communist regime. Bankrupt. The hotels were owned by the by the government, and no money had been invested in them for, for years. And there was no, no money. It was terrible. I used to go around. Um, I remember going to I went to see the president of the Seychelles, and uh, he said, oh, "He says, tell him I've got so much debt. This country's got so much debt." I said, "How much debt do you have?" He said, "Seven hundred million uh, debt." And I said. I said, well, I've got two billion of them there. I said, that might seem to manage all right. <laughs> well, um, was, that, was that Nankin or somebody else? Okay, well, look, listen, uh, you asked me at the beginning, so it is, it's an hour, it's long, I mean, it's quite long. I said, look, it's past, uh, past an hour. Uh, so, well, thank you very much, uh, Rocco. And will you please, all of you, join me in thanking uh, Sir Rocco Forte? coming to China.